、工会副主任委员、国生导师王新军教授、郑州大学第一附属医院神经外科主任、河南省医学会神经外科分会主任委员、国生导师刘先志教授，以及河南河南省。卫计委巡视员黄伟厅长，河南省卫计委医政医管处处长钱长俊，河南省卫计委河卓交流处处长郭万森，河南省人民医院院长顾建新。啊，我是咱们河南省医院的副院长，呃，脑血管医院院长于传亮。让我们在此对他们的到来表示热烈的欢迎和衷心的感谢。今天，参会的代表还有来自全国神经外科专业委员会委员、河南省神经外科专业委员会委员。河南省第四县级医院神经外科主任顾干医师，以及本院神经内科、神经外科、介入科医护人员近四百多人，感谢大家的到来和积极参与。下面有请河南省人民医院顾建新院长致欢迎词，大家欢迎。名家云集，大咖齐聚，群贤弟子，欢迎您的到来！欢迎大家来到河南省人民医院，参加我院携手世界一流神经外科专家尤哈教授、多伦斯教授、兰奇诺教授、韩道明斯教授等多位。海内外的神经外科专家共同举办二零一八优哈国际神经外科大师的精品班，欢迎大家！借此机会，我要感谢姜卫健院长、徐斌教授、张鹏教授等国内外的著名的神经外科专家给予我院支持和帮助，感谢芬兰大使馆。康雅公司给予我们的合作、积极的关注和支持，感感谢黄伟主任、钱长进处长、郭万生处长给予的关注和指导，感谢张新忠教授、刘宪志教授、王新军教授积极的支持和帮助，感谢大家。河南省人民医院。这一所具有一百一十四年历史的百年老院，近年来，医院明确战略定位，坚持走多区多院规模适度、重点学科特色突出、内涵发展、文化引领、互联智慧、健康服务，凸显在河南省域范围内区域的引领作用。我们的院中院，河南省脑血管病医院。正是基于这样的发展理念而建立起来的。目前，河南省脑血病医院依托河南省人民医院成立，整合了神经内科、神经外科、神经介入、神经康复、神经影像、急诊、急救、院前、院内等多个学科的临床、医技、科研、教学、诊疗资源。构建了比较强大的医疗团队，实现了多学科的无缝衔接，成为集医疗、教学、科研为一体的脑血管病综合诊治创新平台。同时，起步于福音医院的河南省人民医院，也长期致力于医疗科技领域的国际化合作
、交流和创新，着眼于打造具有中原特色、中国特色的国际化医疗服务品牌。尤哈教授曾担任赫尔辛基大学中央医院神经外科主任，并带领这一中心成为欧洲最大的脑血管病治疗和科研中心。他的手术视频。学术著作是全球神经外科医生们学习的典范。高伦斯教授在海绵体内病变方面有着丰富的手术经验，曾受邀到美国的九个州和其他大陆的二十一个国家，对四十二个神经外科中心的颅脊病变患者进行手术。他还在国际神经外科期刊上发表了大量的学术文章，参加数百场。国际神经外科会议，并做精彩的学术演讲。兰吉诺博士来自美啊，他在脑肿瘤、脑动脉瘤、烟雾病、颈动脉狭窄等治疗领域具有丰富的临床诊疗经验和独到的学术见解。传道明斯教授任职于东京女子医科大学八千代医疗中心脑神经外科，在颅内血肿。巨大脑动脉瘤、脑血管搭桥等方面具有丰富的临床经验。这一次，这些在神经外科学世界鼎鼎大名的一流专家来到河南省人民医院，联手土木名院士、侯格、安德森教授、詹姆教授、姜卫健教授、刘建林教授、张鹏教授、徐斌教授、李天晓教授等国内外著名的神经科学。神经外科及神经技术专家共同开始优哈国际神经外科大师精品班的课程，为大家奉上连续五天、接连四十台的经典手术现场演示。课程期间，还将设置学术讲座和病理分析环节，为大家创造与大师们面对面的交流、交互式的探讨，是一个非常难得的机会。就在半月前刚刚闭幕的二零一八年中国脑卒中大会上，尤哈教授表示，他非常高兴能和河南省人民医院神经外科团队一道，打造具有国际化视野、国际一流的神经外科中心，将致力于为河南、为海内外的动脉瘤、动静脉畸形、脑肿瘤等患者提供可定制的精细化的医疗服务。同时，尤哈教授及其团队还将依托河南省人民医院技术优势，开展基于中国疾病谱的脑血管疾病综合治疗和相关的大数据研究。这对我院乃至整个中原地区神经外科医疗水平的跨越式提升有着积极的意义。目前，河南省脑血管病医院神经外科专业已经进入了一个良性的发展轨道。展现出强劲的可持续发展态势。截至目前，我们基本搭建起了立足中原、辐射全国、连通国际的神经外科学术平台，让河南的神经外科学者能够时刻追踪、牢牢掌握国际前沿的信息和技术，并通过这个平台，集中向国内外同行们展示河南省脑球病医院神经外科治疗的发展。创新，在座的各位专家都是各医院神经外科领域的精英和骨干力量，有着深厚的学术功底和丰富的临床经验。我们相信，通过这次大师精神班的课程，各位专家能够分享和交流多年的学术前沿成果，必将推动全省乃至全国神经外科专业诊疗水平的前进步伐。在此。我衷心祝愿全体参会人员从此次课程的学习中博采众长，增进交流，开拓视野，收获优异。再次衷心感谢各位专家远道而来，感谢各位领导给予的支持和帮助，为此次大师精神班成功举办付出精心劳动的各位同仁、各位同道，祝精品班圆满成功！谢谢大家。
感谢顾院长热情洋溢的支持，感谢你对我们的鼓励。下面有请尤哈教授讲话，大家欢迎。The colleagues, the President Gu. Professor Lee and all others in Henan Provincial People's Hospital. I'm very grateful, happy, and proud to be here. Like I yesterday said, everything has been extremely fast. First time, intermediated by Professor Subin, I met Henan Provincial People's Hospital neurosurgeons. Uh, he did by Professor Lee in August, and now I'm here, giving and beginning uh, the second life course here. It is great honor to be here, and I feel extremely honored that my role model, hero, in condolence, is here, and all my international guests coming from far away, Mexico, Victor Hugo, uh, Professor Akechuku Kawashima from Tokyo, my friends, Ajma Semmar from Vancouver, Hugo Andrade from Venezuela or Germany, and so on. So there's a <coughs> really international team here present. And uh, I have been asked, what can, I, what can one man do, or even supported by several people? So I'm used to that question. When I became chairman in Helsinki in 97, I was asked the same question by the chief nurse. Do you think you can change something here? So I didn't speak so much after that with her, but I changed a lot. And I had plans to change Helsinki. I had plans to change Helsinki, but the, it became completely different in 18 years. The plans became by far higher and by far better than I had planned. And I think we can do together. We can build a great center here. And because of that, I want to show a video here, if possible. This, uh, uh, I saw a video, There's, it is symbolizing that we should dream, we should have dreams, plans, and we should have dreams that are high, and in this video you see El Condor, this is the eagle flying highest in the world. Maybe we cannot reach this height, but we can come close to it if we dream. And one most important thing, if we must work hard. I was teached by my teachers in Zurich, Switzerland, where I studied medical science and brain research institute. Uh, leader, Professor Konrad Acker, told me that the day has 25 hours. So it meant that you have to work hard to reach your goals. So, I hope this video will run. It's a nice video telling about my time in Helsinki and in the world. Sound. 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 Sound, so we have sound.
So this is El Condor living in South America, eagle flying the high. So let's have dreams, let's have plans to fly high. We will fly in Hena. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. It is my pleasure to bring the greetings from the Finnish Embassy in Beijing to Henan Province and Zhengzhou, and to this second Juha Hedness in the Life Force, which brings together neurosurgery experts from all over the world. I'm very honored to be present here today and to witness cooperation between China and Finland in the field of health with all of you. I'm also impressed by this hospital and its achievements, including in promoting international exchanges and cooperation. We diplomats are quite used to speaking about the topics we are not experts on. We know something about everything, but not everything about something. That is why I feel very humble speaking in front of you today. Your field of work, neurosurgery, 
requires such a level of expertise and experience. Your work is demanding not only intellectually and technically, but also emotionally. But I think that uh, neurosurgery and leap diplomacy have something in common. Here I would like to quote Professor Juha's words. He has said in an interview, and I quote, there are three things required of a good neurosurgeon. <coughs> you need to be a good doctor, you need to be a good neurosurgeon, and you need to be a good human being. Being a good human being is most difficult. You have to be able to treat patients and fellow humans with respect. End of quote. So I think it is the people who are at the center of our work, both in neurosurgery and in diplomacy. Ladies and gentlemen, last year Finland celebrated its 100th anniversary of independence. In the beginning of the 20th century, Finland was one of the poorest countries in Europe. So in just 100 years, Finland has developed into an educated, innovative, and high technology country. We have managed to stop, uh, jump to the top of the world. And this has been proven by different international country rankings where we are often among the top countries, if not the top country. And this success would not have been possible without investing in people. From early on, we realized that people are the most valuable resource our country has. We understood the importance of education. The World Gas Finnish educational system offers equal opportunities for all. Today, Finnish people are highly educated. More than 40% of Finns hold a higher education degree. So this is the basis for the fact that Finland is also one of the most innovative countries in the world and has top know-how in many different fields, including in neurosurgery. Earlier this year, Finland reached one more top position in the country ranking. According to the United Nations World Happiness Report, Finland is the happiest country on this planet. So what makes us Finns happy? is the quality of life and one aspect of that quality is also health. The scope, accessibility and quality of Finnish healthcare are state of the art in many respects. Ladies and gentlemen, Finland and China enjoy a very good and long relationship. Finland was one of the first countries one of the first Western countries to recognize and to establish diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China in 1950. Since those days, our relations with China have broadened and deepened continuously. And I'm pleased to say that today they extend to all sectors of society. Last year was very special for the Sino-Finnish relationship. President Xi paid a historic state visit to Finland in April 2017. During the visit, President Xi and our President Minister agreed on a joint partnership declaration, which very well illustrates the strong commitment of both countries to further deepen our relations. Soon after that, our Prime Minister Juha Sipila visited China in June 2017. During his visit, over 50 trade and investment agreements and letters of intent were signed in many different fields, such as clean tech, education, and winter sports. The Finnish and Chinese authorities and companies, different actors, are now very actively doing their part in putting, in putting the words of the joint partnership declaration into action and there is still a lot of untapped potential for cooperation. The establishment of Juha Hermesniemi International Center for Neurosurgery is also an excellent example 
and an important milestone in cooperation between Finland and China. We are very pleased that uh, Professor Juha decided to come to China and chose Henan Professional People's Hospital as his base. I'm convinced that the cooperation between Professor Juha's team and the hospital will boost exchanges between Finland and China in the medical and health field to a new, to a new level. Ladies and gentlemen, in fact, uh, cooperation in the field of neuroscience between Finland and China is not a new thing. Or in 2005, Finland and China were the key partners together with Canada, establishing a four-year research program in neuroscience. This was the first jointly funded research program that China launched with any European or North American country. The research program brought together more than 20 research groups from Canada, China, and Finland. The groups explored different key areas of neuroscience, such as neurodegeneration, neuroplasticity, memory and learning, and as well as ethical aspects related to neuroscientific research. Finnish expertise in neuroscience, neuroimaging, and neurosurgery is exceptionally strong considering the small size of our scientific community. The new Finnish neurosurgery expertise is also acknowledged worldwide. <coughs> Professor Juha's, Juha is an excellent example of exceptional skills and experience in this field. He is regarded as the master in micro neurosurgery. He is known to the whole neurosurgical world. Thanks to him, the neurosurgery department in Helsinki University became the destination for thousands of neurosurgeons from all corners of the world who wanted to learn from him and his team. I think now they all will flock to Teng Chow. Professor Yuha Center and this hospital bring the best skills and services together for the benefit of the patients and also for the benefit of neurosurgery. I am convinced that the cooperation between Yuha's team and the hospital has a bright future ahead. I wish the best of success to the cooperation. And I'm, I also wish a very successful life for us during the coming days. Thank you for the invitation, and uh, I hope you can all fly high in Kana. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you, Kaya. Kang Jia Ste, Nisi. 最后有请河南省卫计委巡视员黄伟厅长讲话，大家欢迎。尊敬的芬兰公使，卡亚·康加斯凯特女士，尊敬的尤哈教授以及团队，各位专家、各位学者，首先，我代表河南省卫生计生委，向芬兰公使康加·卡亚·康加斯凯特女士专程来到河南。参加这次国际经神经外科大师精品班的开开班仪式，同时也要对尤哈教授等国际级专家友人莅临我们河南，而且对我们河南开展帮助和指导我们卫生事业的发展表示衷心的感谢。河南是一个历史悠久，是中华民族。和华夏文明的发祥地之一，也是我们中国第一人口大省，同时呢，也是病例大省、病残大省。那么这些年来，改革开放的河南啊，在快速发展，人民群众。
对美好生活追求的同时，对健康的需求也越来越高。那么这次，优哈教授团队到河南来开展学术交流以及学术培养，对我们河南来说啊是一个福音啊，因为在这里通过优哈教授这个团队，我们可以更加。开拓国际视野，开展学术交流，努力提高我们的诊疗能力和诊疗水平。特别是通过友哈教授，今后将长期啊到河南来帮助我们开展工作，将汇集到河南的啊亿万群众，使我们河南许多许许多多患者能够在家门口。就得到国际水平的啊高水平诊疗。那么这次呢，优哈团队啊又在我们河南省人民医院举办神经外科啊大师级的精品班，呃，这也是我们河南卫生事业国际化，包特别是我们河南省人民医院、河南省。神经血管病医院的改革开放，他们走出的坚实一步。希望我们河南的同仁们能够充分的抓好这次学难得的学习机会，虚心求教，同时也要建立好一个良好的机制，为大师们长期来河南开展工作和学术交流提供好。各种平台和服务。说最后呢，我也愿我们这个大师精品班能够长期的举办下去，啊，能够刚才像工时所讲的，培养出更多的好医生，更多的好神经科医生，能够使更多患者恢复健康的好人。谢谢大家。谢谢黄厅长，也谢谢各位领导、嘉宾的精彩支持。本届友哈神经外科大师培训班是河南省脑血管医院继成功签约友哈教授后，又一次大规模引进世界顶级大师的重大发展举措。我们相信，有这些国际顶级大师的引领与带动，我省乃至全国的脑血管领域。将实现跨院制的发展与腾飞。开幕式到此结束，下面进入这个专题的讲座。呃，先请领导立席，请主持人、学术主持人这个上场。Good morning, everybody.
I'm honored for this uh, enjoy this uh, meeting. Thank you, thank you for the President uh, uh, Now I have I let's begin for the introduce and the lecture. Uh, Variation of the ZC IC by pass for the prevention of the chronic insomnia and the acute floor replacement.那么说几句题外话人在一块工作一起连续的工作and Victor Hugo, Jesus,他们都是具有相似的这种精神特质,这种品质。那么这种品质呢,对我们这种工作,有这种非常重要的启发作用。那么我都想,那么有了这种精神,在鼓舞我们,我们自己的工作一定是可以干得好的。Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, you have and Professor Lee, Professor Ju. Congratulations, the second. Uh, you have international uh, life course. It's great uh, honor for me to be here. And today, I'd like to uh, talk about the variation of the ECIC virus. I work in the uh, uh, Tokyo Women's Medical University. My university consists of the three uh, hospitals. I work in this hospital, the, the head of the uh, neurosurgical department. And uh, you know, uh, the name of the Tokyo Women's Medical University means that uh, medical students, all medical students are women, but uh, uh, of course, uh, patients, staff, doctors are both. First, SDA initiated by us was performed uh, by Bruce uh, in 1967. Yeah. This procedure, uh, of course, uh, for the 
scanning um, patients, but not not for not for scanning patients, but also the uh, for the complex adults or the children. This pie chart demonstrates demonstrates that my experience on the ECI spinal surgeries. The acute flow replacement for the uh, complex arteries are sixteen percent. The others are for a scan patient where the disease and the uh, arteriosclerotic diseases. This this consists of the posterior uh, postabundance. This table shows the variation of the HDI uh, levels. This white one was for a ischemic patient, and the green one uh, for a complex analysis. This orange shows a uh, for, for both. So, at first, I show you the indication for chronic ischemia. This is the pressing ischemic bypass in a long time chronic ischemic condition. In, in these cases, uh, ischemic uh, bypass, uh, sorry, the patient uh, uh, needed the, sorry, uh, Blood supply from the graft is enough, not so immediate. The indication of the uh, for the chronic mistake patient are symptomatic and major vessel occlusion and uh, decreasing the uh, CBF with poor vaso uh, uh, reactivity. You know, this is a cost study. Uh, this randomized uh, controlled studies concluded that uh, ACIC bypass did not reduce the risk of the recurrent lateral stem stroke at two years. But uh, there are may, uh, some uh, big problems. The, the, uh, the, main, uh, the main problems are. The post-operative complications, stent complications are very, very high percentage. And it's very, uh, it's crazy, but that's uh, uh, 93 cases by 30 different science degrees uh, in a different institute within the eight years. It's a big problem. ECIC bypass is uh, adapted for uh, uh, ischemic mental disease. Direct bypass is better than the indirect in, in future stroke prevention and uh, uh, with angiography outcomes. And there are no me uh, meaningful differences in the uh, uh, perioperative complications. And the ECIC bypass. Is also for uh, is uh, effective for also uh, hemorrhagic liver disease. Uh, this trial uh, concluded that uh, that the direct bypass surgery reduces the degrading rate and improve a patient prognosis. So uh, let's move on to the uh, indication for acute flow replacement. A pricing ECIC bypass for intraoperative acute flow interruption. It means that uh, a uh, patient needs a uh, 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 adequate blood supply immediately. The most familiar uh, reconstruction is uh, uh, ICA. In, in this case, is a uh, uh, this case is a uh, uh, intracranial. Uh, uh, giant intradural giant IC aneurysm, and uh, we operated the uh, 
just proximal ligation at the neck with high providers. For cases with good collateral uh, um, supply, we do the uh, in this in these cases <laughs> we do the uh, uh, local bypass SDA MCA bypass because uh, in such a good blood supply, good collateral blood, blood flow, uh, without the bypass just uh, occluded the uh, ICA, uh, the uh, ischemic complication, not only the acute stage, but also the chronic stage may uh, be induced. And the uh, aneurysmal uh, formation, the, there are the some risks, risks of the uh, unusual malformation. This is a replacement of the pipe. This uh, thrombosed uh, VA pipe aneurysm, including the uh, pipe. In such a case, we do the trap of the uh, aneurysm, including the pipe. Uh, with uh, OA hyper bypass. So I'll show you the variation of the IC, IC bypass, including the video. This is our standard SDA MCA uh, double bypasses. For chronic ischemic patients, uh, we always do the SDA MCA double bypasses. The skin E syndrome is on the parietal branch of the STA and pro the uh, anterior and the dissect, dissection of the uh, parietal branch of the STA and then the frontal branch of the STA was dissected from the guardian side and opened the uh, craniotomy and pressing the uh, bypass. As usual, the uh, recipient artery was selected uh, in the temporal side and the frontal side. We introduced the silicon current stem. After the uh, clamp the recipient artery the, and the, uh, pressing the anti-autonomy, the recipient artery was trapped with is trapped. So it's hard, it's hard to detect the orifice in the, such a very small, tiny, uh, 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 tiny size of the recipient artery. In such case, we it, uh, use uh, this silicon stem. Uh, this silicon stem helps us to uh, make a good visible and to reduce the uh, suture in the contralateral size and to expand the recipient artery. Very helpful for us. Before all turning the old suture, the silicon stem pick out and tie the, uh, after that, tie the old sutures. And we also introduce a ultra small micro needle. This uh, tensile micro uh, very uh, small micro needle is very helpful to handling such in the such a uh, very small space, tiny uh, recipient artery, especially in the pediatric cases. Uh, So I show you the video. This is a five years old girl, my man disease, a right side. Now dissecting the parietal branch of the STA. We use the bipolar, not reduce the damage of the uh, graft. After Dissecting the parietal branch, we dissect the frontal branch. This is a recipient artery. After the artery, the recipient artery is a trunk. 
So we put in the uh, silicon rubber stem. It's very good visible. Before tying the suture, the silicon stem to get out from the orifice, and then tie the knot. <laughs> And sometimes we can, it's difficult to find the recipient battery, but uh, uh, many, uh, almost cases can find the in the surface or the silicon fissure. We also careful the, uh, did not, not uh, re, uh, reduce the uh, tears of uh, other, uh, other walls. This is a HCA bypass for my case. The surgical indications are my uh, disease with strong hypoperfusion in the HCA territory and the ischemic symptom in the lower extremities. We use a uh, long run and making the two separate. Crying automates. The, uh, the key of this procedure is the, the shape of the graft. I mean, the, the graft should be the natural course. So the graft placed under the dura. This uh, procedure, of course, uh, take a, a long time <laughs> and uh, uh, some risks during that to craniotomies as a long, long surgical time. But a very, very effective. Whole frontal region are covered by the graft. This case is a reconstruction of the upper visual artery for the chronic ischemic patient. This patient uh, gradually, gradually uh, uh, the, uh, the stenosis was uh, progressive. So uh, uh, VBI, the, this was a uh, uh, Loss of consciousness or so, uh, but also progressing. In this case, we we introduce the uh, uh, SDA uh, SGA bypass via the subtemporal approach. So I I can show you the uh, protective bypass for the uh, giant MCA annulus. In this case. At first, we open the sugar fissure widely, and then placing the SDA MCA bypass in the uh, superior tract of the M2 for the uh, support bypass. Then we placing the uh, temporary grip at the M1 and dissecting the uh, annulus. Finally, we creep the arteries. So, uh, in my case, dissecting the uh, arteries, in dissecting the such uh, giant arteries, arteries, it's a, it, it will take a long time. So, uh, before pressing the temporary creep. I introduced the uh, uh, SDA MCA bypass for support, for support bypass. This is hypo bypass. This case is a giant um, cavernous ICA uh, annuals. <coughs> In such a case, our strategy is just proximal occlusion at the neck with bypass. 
in such a case, um, we open the craniotomy with a uh, skin incision like this, and uh, a small incision at the neck, and uh, uh, a graft was used by the uh, saphenous spray. Between neck and the, uh, uh, cranio the lower part of the craniotomy, we placing the cortex uh, artificial graft, and then the uh, saphenous bed graft was uh, placing in the cortex uh, artificial artificial graft. Like this. This is this uh, uh, vortex uh, artificial graft protects the kink or the twist of the saphenous uh, vein. This is a uh, SCA SCA bypass for vascular aneurysm. I will show you the video. This aneurysm uh, uh, wide neck and the very high position and, and the upper and posterior direction. Before the craniotomy, I prepare the uh, parietal branch of the STA for the uh, uh, graft. And uh, I open the uh, subtemporal craniotomy and then cut the head. This is a post and the SGA. First, I look around the uh, aneurysm. This is south nerve. We can just a part of the, uh, just a uh, part of the aneurysm, but uh, we cannot creep a space, we cannot space a creep. So, this is uh, a below the vaginal uh, artery, below the south nerve. So we, our strategy was uh, not creep, but the proximal vaginal uh, ligation with STDS shape types. Making the STDS shape bypass, we interrupt the uh, vaginal artery just below the uh, origin of the SGA. Prevent the uh, perforating uh, injury. <coughs> Fortunately, uh, this is uh, uh, my successful case. The aneurysm was disappeared one half, one and a half years after operation. But uh, there, of course, there are uh, some. Uh, some risks for the uh, 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 this case can uh, help, uh, but the, the other case may be uh, successful. I'm not sure. And uh, this is the uh, STA, distal PCA bypass through so some temporal approach. I published this approach last year in neurosurgery. The, the indication is such a P1, P2 uh, aneurysm to need the reconstruction of the PCA. Uh, previously, the reconstruction of the PCA to, uh, was done from the uh, occipital inter Interhemispheric inter uh, fissures. Uh, I mean the OA PCA, distal PCA bypass. It needs uh, uh, to separate craniotomy, to separate approaches. But this approach can do the, uh, can reach the, can reach the, uh, the same subtemporal approach. The uh, uh, occlusion. 
of the uh, organism and the making the vitamins. So this is the last uh, video uh, OA five bypass. As usual, we select the uh, caudal loop of the pipe in, in such a cases. But this case, the caudal loop is uh, not so uh, good size. So we select the lateral part of the uh, lateral portion of the pipe as the drug. We make the lateral subcostal approach, and the, this uh, lateral segment of the pica is uh, deep and the near the uh, lower cranial nerves. But the, the size, there are no discrepancy between the graft and the recipient artery. So I select this. In this case, I do the uh, running suture. So finally, I show, I show you the surgical complications. The totally surgical complications uh, for the ischemic cases, there are very low complication rate. You remember the cost study, the ischemic complication was over 14%. But the, our cases, less than 5%. And the complex areas using the uh, 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 some bypasses. This is including the forty uh, posterior posterior bypass and the uh, surgical complication in posterior posterior. posterior. There are high complication rate in the uh, uh, complex areas. We can we can uh, avoid the. Uh, uh, cortical ischemia in the cortical region, but uh, uh, in, this, in these cases, uh, lower cranial nerve uh, damage or the uh, uh, perforator injury, that many of these uh, complications are from the uh, perforator or the lower cranial nerve damage. So there are still unsolved problems. This is a uh, uh, subcortical hemorrhage from the, uh, due to the uh, hyperparfusion syndrome in the abdominal veins. Five minutes. Five minutes. Oh, yes. And uh, this is a uh, contralateral ischemic complication in the uh, 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 pediatric myelin patient. There are not so, uh, uh, there are rare cases, but uh, uh, there are big problems in the uh, complication of the malignant disease. And this is a uh, uh, posterior fossa uh, acute flow replacement. I, I, uh, I mentioned it, uh, before uh, this uh, lower cranial nerve uh, uh, damage uh, problems. Yes, conclusion. There are variations by, uh, of bypass procedures for surgical treatment of ischemia and complex anemia <coughs> with high e effectiveness. Postoperative complication in ischemic cases have a very low rate compared to result in post trial. But uh, uh, surgical complications are increased in the cases of posterior postal lesion. And there are some unsolved problems, and the further studies of the field should be done. Thank you very much. Uh,
河南也有开展了一些。在这方面，我看今天徐斌教授来了。华山最近这几年在这方面做了很多工作，特别是对烟雾病的治疗。特别今天咱们来的日本专家，我们都知道烟雾病是从一九七九年、六九年开始从日本命名的“磨牙磨牙”。说今天有这个机会，有五分钟的时间，大家可以针对这些问题，给咱日本这个专家提出一些一些问题。抓紧时间，就五分钟时间。特别针对后循环的大桥，我看今天介绍了很多后循环的。这一方面，我们国内其实还是很还有很大的挑战性。大姐，好。As for the cross trial, so the ECAC bypass revealed a good outcome for myeloma disease. However, the outcome is not so good for uh, chronic ischemia induced by uh, atherosclerotic disease. So, what's your opinion in your, in your experience? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, the cost trial, cost trial concluded uh, uh, You just said the uh, uh, visibility of complication rate. So what about the, uh, the efficacy? The efficacy. Um, the, the efficacy of the bypass for chronic ischemia induced by atherosclerotic disease. Uh, effectiveness, not morbidity and mortality. I want to. I, I want to know more information about the efficacy, effectiveness. Thank you. Yes. Even in the post trial, it said without the last operative, last uh, after operative operative complication, without <coughs> the effectiveness is very low of the bypass uh, group. The uh, complication rate of the uh, uh, sorry, uh, extended duration is uh, less than uh, zero or four percent per year in the surgical group, but the medical group is around the ten percent per year.好，还有一个问题，还有两分钟的时间，再提供一个后排。后排的一个问题，抓紧抓紧时间。
2002, uh, guideline for disease, did uh, show our the indication, our operative indication, and also uh, did give our the operative time for operation, appropriate time for operation. For example, if a patient with ischemic stroke, ischemic stroke, how long after his, his stroke, how long after appropriate, appropriate for him, for the patient to operation? We know that related with the co complication. Yes. Stroke. Do the operation. Thank you, thank you, Kawasim, Kawasima, the lecture. Thank you. Hi, 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 hi. Wait. The next speaker will be uh, Victor Hugo Perry. As, as Professor Yu has said, as Victor Hugo Perry is, is the best, best doctor in uh, surgical anatomy. Now his uh, title is his title presentation is Circle of Willis Surgical Anatomy. Thank you, Doctor Professor Victor Hugo. -Perez. Thank you. 
就没了。在那个，在这个的互动，嗯，给这个演讲之前，我讲一下这个，这个优化这个下一个题目是优化的这个是，啊，动物们和动物们骑行的开放的险窝，沃尔克的手术并没有消失，我们并不是最后的摩西干人，那么摩西干人呢，这个是少数民族快消失的一个部落民族。那么，在目前那个强大的介入介入治疗，在对脑动脉瘤和动静脉瘤器型的治疗这个这个情况下，那么显微外科手术好像是越来越少了。那么，就是优化这个题目呢，就是针对这一点。那么我们在在 Doctor Vicky Vicky 的报告之后呢，我们会来欣赏那个优化教授这个精彩的演讲。我们看他究竟提出什么样的策策略来对付这个神经外科？好 ，OK。Carótida supraclinolena del lado derecho. Carótida supraclinolena del lado derecho.
Okay. Here, uh, I'm going to show you in this part of the video the Hübner recurrent artery. These are uh, lenticular streaks arteries, these, these ones, the middle and lateral segment. As you can see, they are coming mainly from the middle segment of this branch, of this middle cerebral artery. This is the posterior communicating artery and the choroidal anterior artery. So I'm, I'm very sure that you know this artery. This artery is coming from A2, sometimes in, at the level of the anterior communicating artery. This is A, A1, and this is, what artery is this? The Hübner recurrent artery. Okay, circle of Willis. Uh, here we have uh, uh, the circle of Willis, the anterior cerebral artery, anterior communicating artery, posterior communicating arteries, and the first segment of uh, posterior cerebral artery. Uh, here we have uh, interesting variant. Uh, here we have uh, a small uh, posterior communicating artery, and the posterior uh, communicating artery is uh, bigger than P1 segment. Uh, this uh, kind of uh, posterior communicating arteries are known as the fatal, uh, fatal, fatal variation of uh, the posterior communicating artery. Both, both are fatal variant. Uh, I used to to inject if if we uh, want to know um, the arteries and veins, uh, it's much better to inject them. Here I am injecting the, uh, brain, the brain veins. This is a, a beautiful video but it doesn't matter if it is beautiful or not. The most important is that we can recognize every branch of the veins of the arteries if we do this kind of injection. This is a fresh brain, but we can inject these brains out of the core or inside. It's much better to inject inside, but we cannot take this kind of uh, view. Uh, this is the result of, a, of an injection of the arteries and veins in the lateral aspect of a brain. Uh, this is another video. Here we have the anterior communicating artery, A1 in the right side, A1 in the left side. 
the anterior communicating artery is very, very short. A2, right side, A2, left side. The arteries that are coming from this anterior communicating artery are the hypothalamic and some uh, chiasmatic arteries. This is the lamina terminalis. The lamina terminalis is open. These are the small branches that are coming from this segment of the artery. This is an aspect if you don't inject the brain. So if you inject the brain, we can have a much better pictures. This is a, an anatomical variant of this communicating artery. This, this communicating artery has the most significant variants of anatomy. So here we have A1, A1, A2, and A2, and this branch coming from this communicating. This is another view of a, a brain without injection, and this is with an injection. Here we have the optic <laughs> nerves, optic chiasm, lamina terminalis, supraclinal carotid artery in the left side, right side, and the A1 segment of both anterior cerebral arteries. And these branches are coming from this complex of arteries. Uh, the circle of Willis A1 segment send branches to the anterior perforated substance. Most of these arteries from the proximal half of one. The proximal half of this <coughs> anterior cerebral artery. The recurrent artery is the largest and the branches to the anterior are going to the anterior perforated substance. The recurrent branches enter the full medial lateral extent of the anterior perforated substance uh, I, I explained this in the first video. Uh, here we have an interesting uh, variant anatomic. This is uh, known as the uh, artery or of wider of wider pemphil. Uh, it's also known as thermatic artery. This artery is a big, very big artery that is coming from this communicating anterior anterior communicating artery uh, is present this artery in less than five percent of brains it's not usual to find this kind of artery here we have this artery thermatic artery here we have a1 a1 anterior communicating artery posterior communicating artery both of these arteries are hypoplastic. When they measure less than one millimeter, they are, they are known as hypoplastic variant. And here we have the tip of the basilar artery, posterior, posterior cerebral artery, B1 segment. The P Com A, the posterior communicating artery, forms the lateral boundary of the circle of Willis, uh, arises from the posterior medial surface of the supraclinal carotid artery. This is the supraclinal carotid artery, and this is the posterior communicating artery. Between the origin of the, of the ophthalmic artery and the terminal bifurcation, runs backward and medially below the tubercinarium. This is the tubercinarium above the cella turca or cella turcica and medial to the oculomotor nerve to join the posterior cerebral artery. Here we have another video. Both optic nerves some arachnoid.
the A1 in the left side, A1 in the right side, an anterior communicating article. <coughs> Aragnoid The longitudinal fissure. If we open this fissure, we can see the A2 segment of both anterior cerebral arteries. <laughs> Remember the hypothalamic anterior artery that is coming in this site. Uh, when the PICOM posterior communicating artery remains the major origin of the posterior cerebral artery, is there fetal variation, like in this in this uh, uh, in this in this uh, case, uh, we didn't have a posterior communicating artery. So the the P2 is coming from directly from the supraclinal carotid artery. Here we have the branches that. are arising from P1 and P2 of the posterior cerebral artery. This is posterior communicating artery in the left side, mammillary bodies, scenarium, and premammillary part of the floor of the tear and interpedicular fossa. The optic track, pituitary stall and the optic chiasm to reach the thalamus, hypothalamus, subthalamus, and internal capsule. Let's go to see if I remove the hypothalamus, what we can, what we can see. Look at this. I, I uh, reset the hypothalamus to see these interesting branches of the posterior communicating artery. The posterior part of the circle of Willis, the complex series of perforating vessels arising from this segment have relationship to the extraocular nerves and upper brainstem. They are exposed in surgical approach to the basilar apex and tentorial notch. The thalamoperforating artery enters the brain through the posterior perforated substance. Here we have the posterior perforated substance. And is the most important artery in this segment. The thalamo perforating artery is this one. The biggest, the biggest in this region. Another artery is coming from this segment are the middle posterior choroidal artery and the branch to the quadriceps heminal plate. This is the tip of the basilar artery, a posterior cerebral artery, P1, P2. The posterior portion of the circle of Willis sends perforating arteries to the encephalon and middle, middle brain risk of occlusion of these vessels during tumor and or aneurysm. Surgery includes visual loss, some aesthetic disturbances, motor weakness, memory deficits, autonomic imbalance, diplopia, alterations of consciousness, abnormal movements, and endocrine disturbances. Here we have another view. 
Here we have the optic nerves, middle cerebral artery, supraplanar carotid artery. The fourth nerve, I have been working the injection of arteries about 28 years. I wrote a book uh, in Spanish language about uh, 19 years ago. In that time, I have so many kinds of variations, anatomical variations of these arteries. Like in this case, this is a complex variation anatomy. Here we have the tip of the basilar artery. If you see this artery before or below the third cranial nerve, this is known as a uh, as superior cerebellar artery. And this one is the posterior cerebral artery, this one. Su superior cerebral artery and this one also in the right side. And several branches that are going to the posterior perforate substance. Thanks a lot. Victor那么他有大量的撕裂来显示的非常细小的血管结构那么我曾做过那么几十例的大脑的解剖结构那么能看得非常细致的非常显微的那么分支获得非常好的感情认识那么那个Victor护工呢护工Paris这次给我们提
Thank you.我的意义讲的不是很好uh, I think that uh, you were uh, talking about the thermatic uh, artery, that the big uh, branch that is coming from the anterior communicating artery. This uh, thermatic artery is going through the, to, uh, uh, between the both uh, hemis uh, hemispheres, brain hemispheres, and goes to the motor cortical zone. The, in, 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 they are going till the motor cortical uh, region. In the middle, in the medial aspect of the brain. This is the importance of that big artery, known as thermatic artery. You are talking about that, yes? Are you talking about this, uh, this artery? Okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Victor Foucault. Yohan,有请到尤哈教授。他这个题目其实具有特别具有挑战性,我不知道大家注意了。他的题目演讲题目是 甚至点时间，我还是想多说几句。呃，其实这几年咱们神经介入发展非常非常快。呃，由于社会的原因，可能是有一些在被用上或者有，但是看谁的效果好就是谁的。好，时间到，请尤哈教授演讲。I 
fearless, simple, fast to be by preserving Ramayana. That's a great Seventeen years in Kuopio and then eighteen years in Helsinki since nineteen ninety-seven until two thousand fifteen as professor and chairman. So we have a large experience on cerebral aneurysms and very good databases, follow-ups of all these seventeen thousand patients with more than twenty-two thousand aneurysms, and this is the experience with the uh, uh, Sopra alternative malformations and dural AV fistulas with also good data cases and hundreds of publications on those surpassed cases. So, out of these, I have personally operated more than 6,000 aneurysms and uh, more than 600 surpra ABFs. So, there are three randomized studies and treating cerebral aneurysms. This is the Guopia study from Eastern Finland that I was involved as a surgeon. Then there's the ISAT study. I didn't want to participate in ISAT study because we had done already the first study in Eastern Finland. We saw no difference in endo or extravascular treatment. And then Professor Spesser made in the Phoenix, Arizona, Pratt study. And both ISAT and Pratt study have concluded that the new randomized study should be done. And we are planning to do after many plannings and discussions of Henan and Russian randomized study because this is a single hospital with a huge number of cerebral aneurysms. You cannot find that kind of hospital internationally in Europe or USA with more than one around more than 100 cerebral aneurysms a year. So, let's, I have been involved in the discussion of the treatment of cerebral aneurysms so long time. About the ISAT study, I can only say that uh, it was done boots in the feet of the surgeons. It means that the microsurgical level was not good because there was not good skills. Boots are used to protect your pants and feet for bleedings. So to have exact knowledge of your treatment, you need long-term follow-up and you, you need good follow-up studies, you need good databases and to do to plan a database is extremely easy, but to do a database for a long period is extremely hard work. There is nothing that is uh, harder than doing a database. Even scientific writing is less uh, difficult. So I made in Kuopio first analysis database. Then I made for Professor Drake and PLS for the vertebral basilar aneurysms. I made the database and when I became professor in Helsinki, I asked several people to do aneurysm database for Helsinki. Most of them failed, but this young lady, Anna Lehto, she sacrificed seven years of her life to do a database in Helsinki. And so we had a huge number of knowledge on cerebral aneurysms combining the Kuopio database and Helsinki database. So one important thing as comparing the results is the patient selection. In Finland, in a small country, it is divided in five parts. 
So Helsinki as a capital is getting the southern part of Finland, around 2 million people. There is only one neurosurgical center taking care of the patients. So we get all unselected material. We get all the cases to one center. You cannot say no to the patient to be sent to you. So we have to take also poor grade patients. And this is the difference from metropolitan centers. So one example, this is uh, nearly 20 years ago, 99. This is uh, a 75 years old lady intubated and conscious in respirator, severe subarachnoid hemorrhage, difficult vertebra pica aneurysm, was operated on by microsurgery first day after bleeding. Of course, if you are treating that kind of cases, you have to count with morbidity and mortality. But you have to be also a medical doctor to take care of your patients. This is very important. So it has been spoken that uh, microsurgery is dead. We are not the last Mohicans. We are not stagnating like he's saying. We are not just sleeping. We continue all the time getting better because experience is making you better all the time. I'm certainly I'm certain that I'm doing by far better neurosurgery now than 25 years ago. So this is the personal experience and also the, the combined experience of the uh, microsurgical society. So one thing is sure, and uh, I stick to this sentence, which I have written a long time ago, when you can approach the aneurysm by open microsurgery and put a clip on the base of this deadly sac, perfect clip like we wrote with Dr. Pierles, this is extremely effective means because the endotails are pressed together. We kill the aneurysm after clipping and this is very important. I think it is different to put the clip on the base of the aneurysm, sacular aneurysm, than to put something inside it, because the aneurysm remains open and in long term, many times recurrences are seen, like was shown in a good follow up, the long term follow up study from Tampere, Finland. To push stents in this short segment focal diseases, I feel also very, uh, very complex treatment because with the cheap short clip you can treat these aneurysms. But endovascular surgery has developed; it is attractive. If open microsurgery wants to survive, we have to be good and efficient. We have to be both. Otherwise, open microsurgery certainly will die in vascular surgery. So, how to be effective? You have to plan your surgery as well. You have to do clean surgery. Clean surgery means fast surgery. And you have to be effective to be able to treat several cases a day, otherwise this is not cost effective. Bloodless field means exact working. So in the last 20 years, we didn't reserve any blood for aneurysm or AVM operation. It is not a recommendation. It is just showing that we were working clean and it was not bleeding. So when I was in Helsinki 18 years, so this lousy old hospital <laughs> became one of the meccas of uh, neurosurgical visitors. So more than 3,000 people came to Helsinki to see the surgeries. You see the map here, there are the needles where the people were coming. Many came also from China and I got good connections 
with the Chinese neurosurgeons during that time. But most times when I was operating, it was all the time like life course. Life course, many visitors, many fellows uh, helping in the surgery, observing the surgery. And one of the most important things is good anesthesia. So don't fight with your anesthesis. You are a team. So in, once in Latin America, I was asking about the blood pressure of the patient. I had the nasty answer. I do my things. Do your things. This is not good because we are a team taking care of the patients. So good anesthesia, like here in Henan, I have observed, is extremely important. It, uh, you can avoid a lot of school-based resection, brain compression, brain destruction with good anesthesia. This is very important. And good teamwork. For me, the most important in open mic surgery is the scrap nurse. Here's Hanalina Janssen. She's coming tomorrow to get involved in the live surgeries with us. She knows what I'm thinking. I don't know what she's thinking. But the instruments are flying in my hands, and this makes the surgery very fast because she knows what which are the next steps. So this is a picture from Helsinki 2006. Here is uh, Professor Jacques Moret and uh, Chuha Ernest Emi, like he's calling me. So uh, we were invited around the world to have heavy discussions which one is better endovascular or exovascular treatments. So, uh, Jack West Moray was always saying that he can treat every anorus by endovascular means, and I was saying I can do the same with open microsurgery, and then we have heavy discussions. And of course, the truth is not 100%, the truth lies somewhere between that nowadays. But 2006, I showed Jack Moray my surgeries, made 15 cases in a few days. And after that, he told, you may continue. So I'm one of the few or the only one who has the license to continue open microsurgery by uh, Jack Moray after this presentation. He said, OK, you, have, you may continue. I don't know if this license is still uh, okay. So nowadays they say that uh, it is a crime to clip posterior circulation aneurysm. This is a message from uh, <laughs> Professor Moray and his group. It is not true. I have done more than 600 uh, cases, or then I'm a big, big uh, criminal. Because one of the important things in treating the aneurysm is also the cost, costs. So the stents are expensive and have also complications. If you have skills, you can do posterior circulation aneurysms, like in my series, 10%, more than 600 were posterior circulation aneurysms. Some examples here this patient is coming from Russia, he's a, a veterinary. The medical doctor had a ruptured large aneurysm at the basilar tip, went to Burdenko Institute, Moscow famous institute, birthplace of the endovascular surgery by Serpinenko, but was not treated. It was not treated because not treated by endovascular means you can think how would you treat this case. The patient was also not operated on him. Burdenko, but came to Helsinki and I operated him, him by subtemporal approach and the other post operative controls. Do you see, like we wrote with Dr. Pierlens, perfect clip on the base of these deadly sacs. And this, you see that the, there is a ring clip, penetrating clip, leaving the artery coming from the base of the aneurysm uh, inside it. Another example. Young female, today, subparagonic hemorrhage, comes to hospital, see with a subparagonic hemorrhage, has this basilar trunk, small aneurysm. Small aneurysms are extremely difficult and dangerous because they have nearly no substance. 
in the walls. So I made in the evening basic mode approach and put temporary clip on both sides of Pasila Atri and then clip, double clip the aneurysm to have all the substance inside the clip. And this is the post operative DSA showing perfect clipping of the aneurysm. The patient made good recovery. So we have a lot of middle separatory aneurysms. In our database, more than 6,000 aneurysms. 6,000 aneurysms. MC aneurysm. So I think if you treat these aneurysms by stance, extending the curve of the MC aneurysm, uh, M1, M2 here, and treat this very extensively endovascularly, it is completely different game than to open the head and put the simple clip on the base of this aneurysm. So we have to think and discuss also about these things because simple clip in the MCA annals, which are many times complex, is very effective and good treatment. So, whatever you are doing, there are late complications. If you are doing endovascular surgery or open microsurgery, there are late complications. And one of the most uh, important is spasm. And here you see a young female patient, completely okay after acute treatment of the bacillar tip aneurysm by endovascular means because I was traveling and she was walking perfect. Then one week after subarachnoid hemorrhage, is getting headaches getting grossy, getting hemiparetic, and then dying in extremely large infarction of delayed uh, spasm. So one thing is important, and you will see it during the week. Please take a look. It is easy to discuss every treatment, to plan, criticize, but it is different to walk the walk than to talk the talk. It is completely different game to do then the surgery in front of people. Remember that when you come back home, it is faced also with your team or the cases. So this is uh, to operate on in front of other critical eyes is 10 to 15 times more difficult than regularly in, alone in operation room. So how is the future? We don't know the future. We, of course, we try to fly high and develop everything, but the future will be complex. In open microsurgery, in endovascular surgery, besides technology, there are levels of manual skills. Here is Robert Spessler, 2009, visiting Helsinki, and I was showing one pericardial artery aneurysm surgery for him because he was opponent in a large series of more than 500 pericalosa artery aneurysms by PhD by Dr. Martin Lehetska and I showed my techniques to him. Take a look. The time is 9.10. The operation has been done already. So we are discussing the operation. So why microneurosurgery is going down? There's deep cap, there are fears, and lack of skills. And why there's lack of skills? There is poor training, love of comfort, because hard training needs hours, 10,000 hours, like I said, or 10,000 days in operation room. This is extremely important. Otherwise, you cannot do well, whatever you are doing. When doing open microsurgery, the wall of the aneurysm is the most important factor. If the aneurysm wall is thick, it is difficult to use the clip. And so we have to have in the large aneurysm, we have to have intraoperative control intraoperative DSA, here in Henan, you have a hybrid room, then you can do very well 
this operation. Our ICG game, it has helped a lot. Doppler always also. And you should be ready to do bypasses if needed. But this is very important. In nanovascular surgery, more is not so important because you are going inside the vessel. So it doesn't matter how the wall is. But there are cases like this one. This one you cannot do, clip. This one you cannot treat by endovascular treatment. Only if you have exceptional uh, retrograde flow to the MCA. But this was done by bypass surgery, this large calcified tumor like MCA aneurysm. And here there is a large based basilar tip, basilar bifurcation aneurysm with intraoperative DSA with GM perfect lip on the base of the aneurysm and after uh, surgery then DSA after clipping of the <coughs> aneurysm. So this is sure this aneurysm will not recur. Most of the coiled basilar bifurcation basilar tip aneurysms recur when you follow up them. And here is a giant middle cell proprietary aneurysm, tumor-like edema around. Jehovah Witness means that these patients don't accept blood transfusion. It is their religion. And I agree, I don't eat blood, but I operated on this aneurysm with temporary clip. And this is intraoperative angiography. You see the, after resection of the aneurysm, perfect lips on the base of the aneurysm's vessel open, and please take a look on the opening. It is a large craniotomy. Big respect to the lesion. So don't try to do two small windows, difficult cases. This is my message. And we have tried always to do our extreme. In a small hospital, is more easy than a huge hospital where you don't know what is, everything is happening. Here a male, young male, 28 years old male, came on Monday after getting headache 12 o'clock and then getting next bleeding a few hours later, getting drowsy, brought to hospital, was already it had a three, third bleeding and in the emergency room, fourth bleeding and had both pupils dilated. We had Madame the CT. So big hematoma, artery complicating artery, we gave magnetol and rushed immediately to operation room, treated the aneurysm, took the hematoma out, and the patient recovered in spite of that both dilated pupils because we were so fast. We were so fast so he could return home to take care of his three children. He was not able to work, but was a good father for the children. So, we have to try more to try to do, uh, extend the limits of our indications. And these are collection of our, our database where we think where endovascular uh, treatment fails immediately or in long term. This is in large and giant aneurysm. I don't say they are easy for open microsurgery, but also very small aneurysms when ruptured are difficult to treat by endovascular means effectively. Middle cerebratory aneurysms are complex for endovascular surgery. Simple clip is treating MC aneurysm effectively. And then you have patients who are in moribund state because of large hematomas. You have to rush to operation room to take the hematoma out and treat the patient to reduce the intracranial pressure. And then there is white neck dome ratio. It means recurrences. Patients have hydrocephalus and AIDS patients have difficult vessels. Maybe nowadays you can uh, navigate better to these uh, vessels, to these vessels, but there are complications in MRI, you see small infarctions after endovascular treatment. So, and one more important thing is if the patient is young, then the 
clip is the sure, most sure treatment for the patient because it stays and the aneurysm is not recurring. So these are all, all difficult aneurysm. Like my teacher, Professor Drake, late Professor Charlie Drake said, impractical aneurysm because he couldn't treat them by surgery. So you see, this is a collection of difficult, impractical aneurysms which whatever you are doing, endo, exovascular, are difficult to treat. You can say, okay, I push a stent there, but it is, reality is not so uh, simple. So, one of the things that I have seen in Nepal, in a developing country, most of the people in the world are outside of endovascular treatment. So the lips are cheap. Lips are cheap as compared to endovascular treatment. I know the beautiful endovascular uh, operation rooms here in Henan, but this is the situation in the world. So once more, our series, I'm speaking about large experience. I'm not speaking about 50 cases. I'm speaking about 22,000 aneurysms and more than 1,500 AVMs and last personal experience. So I speak about my lifetime experience. And this is the meta-analysis of AVMs, how the AVMs are occluded all around the world. And remember, only the best series are published. The best series are published. So microsurgery, you can occlude of the AVMs 96%. Radio surgery, 38%, selected cases, embolization, 13%, even Ankara, Cecilke, More are saying differently, they can occlude 50 to 60%. I think these are very, very highly selected cases, which are selected for embolization after a long time, go work with. Uh, with the uh, French uh, school, uh, Jack Moray and Speller. So, what is important in AVMs? Important is not Arupa study. This graph is important. This is the long term outcome of AVMs since Second World War in Finland. Of course, during the war time, you didn't operate on aneurysms. You were treating penetrating injuries in the neurosurgical ward. But this is a large series, more than 600 patients. So you see that if the AVM was totally occluded, so in the long term, 30 years, the outcome is by far, far better if the AVM is totally occluded than if they are not treated at all. This is the green line. And between them is partial occlusion. This partial occlusion is coming from the, the historical treatment of occluding pericardial artery, even middle cerebral artery in front, proximally of the AVM by open surgery, not from endovascular. If you endovascularly partially occlude the AVM, then the bleeding rate is three times higher than doing anything. And of course, brain tumors cannot be treated by endovascular means. Only few Valavanis treated the series of skull based meningiomas with beautiful microembolizations in all the patients. I have seen a series that brain tumors need microsurgery, can be helped by endovascular means. And then we have spine brain injuries, this is microsurgery in future. Systemostomy is one of the new tools in treating brain injuries, and this is very important. We can come to that back when treating brain centers. So, having treated more than 16,000 patients, personally, there are a lot of complications, but there are, of course, beautiful cases. This is uh, to 2001, a young girl coming like from concentrating, concentration camp, cachectic with contractors. I operated this 
covered normal, stopped temporarily, and she made beautiful recovery. She's now 25 years old. Yeah, she's around 25 years old. Each has own children. So try always your best, even impossible looking cases. So what is the future? I think aneurysms should be identified before the rupture. And we have done a lot of studies, research for that. But what I think is coming in 20, 30 years, like in treating ulcus ventriculi, it was earlier operated. I assisted as a young medical doctor. Many bill root operations, maybe no one knows anymore. Bill root operation, resection of the ventricle by ventricular or duodenal ulcer. But I was assisting hundreds of them. But then helicobacterium was found, and there is no surgery. Maybe in future we have biological solution. Our research is going for that, that we can treat the aneurysm without endo or exovascular treatment by some other means. And this is the future. So there's no more fighting or competing uh, about which method is best. And one thing is important. We saw the beautiful presentation of Professor Kawashima and Shubin is speaking also about this experience. Bypass surgery is extremely important. And why it is important? Because you train your skills in open microsurgery. This is very important. So this sentence I hear always, and this is why Endovascular Congress is always, I have been in so many. So I hear this sentence, it was impregnated in my mind. So next year, better technology will help us in serving our patients better. So this is true. So we followed these rules. So we created so-called uh, Juha AIDS clip. This is a clip to treat impossible aneurysms. So Dr. Benham Redsai is creating the, this clip and we hope we will find in China a factory to do this clip because it is, it is meant to treat these monstrous uh, posterior circulation analysis, which one you see, like Dr. Drake saw, his golf friend, golf friend had that kind of analysis, and Dr. Drake tried to treat it, and the patient died. His friend died in the surgery. And we have tried also to do every, everything, do bypasses and everything, but one we found an effective treatment is to close the proximal vessel slowly. And here is the team we included through two watch mixes to do the technology. And this is the, the me and the two Iranian origin neurosurgeons, young Reza Behnam Yahromi, and nowadays in New York, Reza Dasti. So we created this clip. You can, those guys, the watchmitches, they are doing watches, handmade, but you have to pay $200, $200,000 for one watch. So the skills are extremely high. So I don't have that kind of watch. So, but to come back to the aneurysm, so this is the simple clip we created to slow slowly, to close slowly. So we wrap the clip with white reel and put the clip proximal on this uh, the Norwegian young patient which, uh, was sent to us with tetraparesis following difficulties. So this, we put this clip and we don't know in which time the clip is closing. This is the difficulty here. With the new clip, we can do it with remote control. But here we put the clip and the patient made very good recovery, like many others also they took it and began to walk. Because the perforators are not occluded when the proximal vessel is slowly closing. So nature is taking care. So 
concluding is I have had the possibility to change of experience, open the microsurgery. A lot of people came to Helsinki. I have been operating around the world uh, many times, also in China. I think one of the important thing, things is stress and open critics and discussion. It improves surgery. You have to be faced with many questions and there are a lot of maybe 2,000 operative videos of mine in internet. We will increase the number in future and we will also record every case here in Henan to spread the, the skills and change experience. So I'm very extremely grateful to all, the, all those people who visited me, who have criticized my surgeries and give good hints to have better results. So in Helsinki, we had 3,000 visitors, like Minister Kangaskorte was saying, maybe they are coming now to in future in Zhengzhou, and we are ready to take them and to change the experience. And now, tomorrow, we are beginning the second life course. So it is great, great to be here. And uh, oh, thank you very much. Thank you. 尽管时间超了点我们就不用查一些了吧有点超时
，对，那个到头顶，对你稍微调整一下的，你稍调整一下，不能把这个这个肉抹太深，稍调整一下，然后动一下吧，微微的，你感觉到太多，微微动。老师，你充电器不最好不要往下放，贴上相机是没有问题的，因为咱是咱是，我就说咱这是接接网络直播的，我担心有问题，你知道吧？多理解一下，好吧？我们专门扯的线都扯过来，其实就为保证网络直播。你要再加很多东西，我担心有问题。特别充电器，那谁的充电器？你能不能不接这样啊？很多地方都可以接电源，那你不需要接不着电源。你是我的主持人。我就我就说你不是这个相机吗？你还要从那接？我担心这个问题，你知道吗？绝对绝对绝对！我们这会提供视频的，真的，我们会提供视频的。你拿手机去录的吗？哎，那接入肯定没有我们这好。他那个，嗯，你看又跑了，都都拼不上看。只要两个，我忘了一直。就是和拼和那个拼音还是原先简中间对吧？对，你是以这两个线为构图。那只要不忘，你就下来直接走都可以。喂，十呃十分钟很短，我们马上就要开始第二节了。因为这个第一节呢超时比较多，我们需要在第二节把这个丢失的时间追回来。啊、嗯，下面呢，下面一个话题是由来自呃多伦多一个非常出色的外科医生，神经外科医生，他非常擅长于颅底的神经外科手术，呃，他的名字叫啊 b o g o a n d e r 下面有请他为大家带来一个话题，是对策入路，治疗前循环动脉瘤。大家欢迎。Excuse me. 不够 ，It's your turn. It's your turn. Please.
พี่ปั๊มตัวทำมาอยู่Good morning, dear colleagues, um, distinguished guests. Uh, welcome. Uh, for me, it's a pleasure to be here again. Uh, this is my second time in Chenzo, and um, I'm going to talk today about uh, contrato approach to anterior circulation manners. I call it as an expansion of minimally invasive techniques. We all of us know what is the evolution of the surgical approaches. We know, since Dandy described the first clinical manners. That the approach in that time was just a frontal temporal craniotomy with the psychoma, or what was called the omega um, sign craniotomy. And there was a big step in microsurgery since Professor Yasaki uh, introduced the Toronto approach. And also, one of the big things in this, um, during this time, it was the incorporation of the microscope and use of the basal systems. So that was a big advance for us. But since then, we have known there's a trend or a tendency to minimal invasive aneurysm surgery. And we have seen that in many, many publications, including the lateral sprout approach described by Juha, the sprout craniotomy described by Bernanski, the material approach described by Spitzler, and so on. But the, all the, the goal for this is to make uh, improvement in cosmesis, improvement in, uh, in hospital state, the patient they, they stayed uh, less time into the hospital, also improve uh, or decrease the cost for the patients and try to improve outcome. But how do we do that? We do that through smaller craniotomies. We have seen that since the beginning from Dandy just like you two towards now. And also we do it with fewer craniotomies. But also we had seen that we can do or we can use endovascular techniques. There is also a combination of endovascular and endoscopic techniques and uh, combined techniques. But all the aim of this is just to improve the trajectories and working angle. And we have seen this since the evolution of the minimal invasive techniques, uh, how it goes with the two uh, currents or two tens from the minimal invasive from the uh, skull based surgery or to the minimal invasive retraction to the brain. But it's easy. Easier when we know that one aneurysm is on the right side, so we choose the right side craniotomy, or if in the left side, we, we choose the left side craniotomy. But what happens, for example, when we have one on the left side, one on the right side, and another one on the right side? So we have several treatment options, and we know that mirror aneurysms, the most frequent locations are thalamic or anterior choroidal or superficial, um, superior hypofacial artery, ICA bifurcation, and middle cerebral artery. Those are the most frequent aneurysms for the mirror or bilateral aneurysms. As we said, we have different treatment options. We can do multiple endovascular treatment. So we have one done, another one, another one done. But what happens when we want to try like, to treat this patient with the open microsurgery? Either we can do bilateral craniotomies or we can do an unilateral craniotomy or what we call contralateral approach. And it's just do it. Can we use my computer? Is it not good? So we can go from the right side approach and then we just dissect the cilium fissure and we go to the other side and we can keep the left side uh, aneurysm. So as we said, the most frequent locations are paraclinal or thalamic or um, superior hypofacial artery. And um, the thing is, if we approach that from the, from the right side and we had an immediately projecting aneurysm, uh, we need to do linearidectomy and we increase the risk of having other complications or risk for uh, optic nerve injury. So it makes the process a little bit longer. So if it's just projected immediately, we can just come from the contralateral side and we have a direct vision of the aneurysm. And in that case, the only problem will be that we need to study uh, characteristics of the aneurysm, including uh, projection, shape, uh, size, uh, presence of calcifications into the carotid artery, um, and also uh, the, the distance of the interactive nerve and the perchiasmatic system. 
So we studied and we published this a couple of years ago. Um, it's the largest series in ophthalmic aneurysms treated through a contralateral approach. And we studied uh, radiological parameters, including the, the prechiasmatic pre system um, space, also the interactive space, and we measured what was the diameter or the distance between the uh, both carotid arteries. And um, as I told you, we need to study properly what are the characteristics for the aneurysms. We can see here, we normally we do a 3D CTA for every aneurysm case, and uh, then we can see the length marks. As you can see there, uh, if we approach from the um, right side, we need to do a complete clinoidectomy to just to get control. To get, um, we have a direct vision of the aneurysm. This is just the same example, same uh, patient. We did a left side lateral supraorbital approach, just left frontal uh, pole retraction and carotid optic system opening. That's the left side um, optic nerve. And we can see the prechiasmatic space. So that's what, something very important because if we have a prefixed chiasma, we, are, we cannot um, clip the aneurysm because we, we don't have the, the vision just as the right uh, ophthalmic artery as the aneurysm, and we just very uh, focused opening of the aneurysm. We only expose the neck of the aneurysm. We don't expose the whole sac, and then we just put a pilot clip. And you can see the ophthalmic artery here, we have direct vision on it. And as I mentioned, yes, the only uh, problem is that uh, sometimes we, we don't have uh, proximal control. And, and those we published something that, that we're going to talk about tomorrow, it was the contractor clipping through um, using transient carded arrest. So we just put a pilot clip now and then ICG just to confirm that patency through the ophthalmic artery. And those is um, quicker. We don't need to do a uh, clinoidectomy, but as I told you, we have to select the cases and we need to study the 3D CTAs. We need to study the prechiasmatic system distance, the interactive distance. And this is just the same example, but to, towards the other side. The patient had bilateral aneurysms, one on the right side, under the, the optic nerve on the right side, and then the inter octave space in the prechiasmatic system and then the clipping of the other side. So, as I mentioned before, uh, aneurysm characteristics, all of our series that were clipping contralaterally, they're on rupture aneurysms. Rupture aneurysms, they had to be treated through the same side. Um, all of them, they were suckler, but they had a small size, less than 10 millimeters. And as I mentioned, the, the uh, optimal uh, projection is a superior medial projection. Uh, and the, in our series, there was uh, most of the patients uh, were treated for the right side craniotomy because uh, it's a dominance for the surgeon. I'm a left-handed surgeon. So for me, it would be easier to, to go to the, to the right side. So as I mentioned before, the radiological criteria for contralateral approach, small aneurysms less than 10 millimeters, simple configurations because we know complex con configurations that they require more complex techniques that we cannot do through a very tiny space or very uh, uh, a small corridor. On rupture aneurysm, as I mentioned before, medial superior or superior medial projection. And as we always do, we always plan everything before the surgery. We uh, do preoperative 3D CTAs because we can manipulate according to the surgical trajectory. So we can see already in our minds and, and before the surgery how it's going to be. And um, as I mentioned before, a specific distances and measurements, we had done that and uh, an MRI for the patients with the, with the ophthalmic arteries and aneurysms. And um, the median for the prechiasmatic distance was uh, five to six uh, millimeters. So we could have enough space to, to clip the other ones. And uh, that's the, one of the most important landmarks. So in our, in our study, the 38 patients with contralateral approach in the ophthalmic artery. Three of them, they have visual deficit and um, is described before actually that our rate of complication was lower, but we could see that the outcome was 93%, it was a good outcome. And 
the, it doesn't mean that the contraceptive approach does not increase the, the risk of having a worse outcome. We published that in uh, 2016. And the other um, locations where we can do a contraceptive approach is the ICA bifurcation, because if you think about it, about the anatomy, you, you have just a straight, like straight angle towards the ICA bifurcation. So the, the perforator is just a slide posteriorly. So you have this straight line of view, like it's completely tangential to the, to the, to the vision. And um, that's what we call a gray viewing angle. And um, the aneurysm just lie above the optic apparatus. And uh, as I mentioned before, the perforator that's behind. So then you can put the clip completely uh, across the aneurysm. And also we can get proximal control. So as we had seen, um, the other place with the frequent um, aneurysm for the bilateral aneurysms is a uh, NCA. And that was the, the picture that I wanted to show you before that we go from the left side and then we go towards the other side. And um, we had this study was the large study also for contralateral uh, NCA clipping and uh, comparing bilateral um, craniotomies and unilateral craniotomies. Um, we only have like 38 patients with the contralateral clipping for the MCAs. Um, however, we measure radiologically what was the distance between the ICA bifurcations, the height of the ICA bifurcations, uh, the length of M1, and, um, and the, uh, yeah, the length of M1. And uh, what was important, we study also the, the characteristics of the aneurysm. As I mentioned before, we do 3D CTAs, uh, and what is important, the projection of the aneurysm. This is just one example of a contralateral clipping. You can see um, just the surgical trajectory that we do. We use always the lateral supraorbital approach. So it's, uh, it's very uh, focused target. And, um, and that's what I mean with the 3D, because we can reconstruct the surgical view. And we already know when we're dissecting how it's going to be. Um, that's one of the examples. And, but as I mentioned, Complex aneurysm, they should be done through an one side craniotomy, unilateral craniotomy. Imagine if we would try to do these cases through, um, through a, a contralateral approach. We cannot do a complex uh, clipping technique, we cannot do aneurysm raffi, we cannot do reconstructions because the, the surgical coral is so small that you cannot do a, a proper um, maneuvers. The other thing is that just to, to, to do a contralateral clipping, it should be an experienced surgeon, at least 100 cases of vascular cases or 200. Um, and we measure the, the length of M1 and it should be less than 20 millimeters because otherwise it's too, too long for the, for the micro instruments. If you think you're coming from the left side and then you're going completely to the right side, it's gonna be around 30 centimeters. So that's too long for us just to get into the corners. Also, the projection of the aneurysm is important. If you have an inferiorly projecting aneurysm or superiorly projecting aneurysm, you can put a clip or medially because um, it's coming into the limit insulate. But if you have a lateral projection aneurysm, it's too difficult just to put the clip in, in that corner or the angle. Um, as we said, we analyzed this and the aneurysms are um, all of them in our series per sackler, the small to medium size, less than 10 millimeters. And again, just simple aneurysms you can do with the contralateral approach because um, as mentioned before, complex aneurysms are too difficult for that and on rupture. And um, what we have done in our series, sometimes you have multiple aneurysms and you have the rupture and you have it on the right side, but then you have another one on the left side. It is a relative contraindication because of the presence of brain edema. It's very controversial, either you do it or not. And um, we know if we secure all the aneurysm, the risk of handling or managing the base pass and they're low and so on for rupture risk. But uh, it's very controversial. It's not completely a one le a level evidence. So, so we have seen in our series, the outcomes is around 83% to 91% is published before by Lawton, um, by uh, Evandro de Oliveira, it's, it's the same 86%. Uh, what we need to focus is to minimize the retraction. As we have seen, we do a very a, like lateral supraorbital approach, very uh, focused target. However, um, 
in our series, we had seen that around 28% of the patients had olfactory dysfunctions. Maybe because the, the approach, uh, you need to retract the frontal lobe, and it's already described, in, including um, up to 48% of um, olfactory dysfunctions. Um, and also, you can see it in an unilateral approach if you're retracting too heavily the frontal lobe. However, we had seen uh, we can dissect the olfactory rootlets and just cover or try to do a little bit wider um, dissection of the sphilium fissure. And as I mentioned before, the careful selection of the patient is the, the, the goal here. You cannot say, um, I'm going to do this through a lateral suborbital approach and then do a contralateral approach if you don't have uh, enough experience and you don't select the patients properly. So the conclusion is minimal invasion can be achieved by uh, maximizing clipping through a one craniotomy. We have seen that and we, it's feasible. So you just need to carefully select the patients while you're doing that. Just want to thank uh, Juha, one of my mentors, and also Dr. Lawton, who was uh, one of my mentors, and also he's uh, done a lot of contralateral clipping. And thank you very much. Thank Uh, thank you, Dr. Hogo, uh, give us uh, the excellent uh, uh, lecture to show you your uh, uh, work. Uh, as we know, uh, bilateral analysis uh, is very complex to treatment. Uh, 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 also, uh, either by uh, open surgery or in vascular treatment. Uh, you you told us you uh, pre the operation you make a detailed three uh, D reconstruction of the the vessel uh, and uh, made a detailed plan. Uh, my question is uh, even even so uh, maybe in some cases uh, you will change you will change the plan and. Uh, uh, have you the experience of of, of a new plan? And if you, if you uh, have, and why? Thank you. No. Thanks. Um, that's a good question, and we have discussed that before um, in Helsinki uh, two two years ago. We discussed about it because if you think you can do it, just go for it. But if it's too dangerous, and you see that you cannot clip it, and just leave it and then come next time for the uh, right side, or like same side approach. Because um, the thing is, uh, for example, you has done that many times. And we discussed and he said, yeah, I can take a look and if I cannot clip it, just leave it like that and then come up on the other side. And it requires experience. If you go to the M1 or to the to the M2 or to the MCA bifurcation, it requires a lot of experience just to dissect contralateral in a very tiny corridor. Otherwise, you know, it's easier if, if in your hands it's easier to do it from one side and then in three months later do it for the other side. At the end, it's benefit for the patient. Hi, uh, Wendy. Uh, are you uh, are going, to, uh, going to a, a keeping a bilateral rhythm after a new, a new rhythm? Uh, which approach uh, do you select it? But you are approach or uh, lateral or super or uh, super orbital approach? Thank you. So um, normally our school is. 
uh, everything through a lateral support orbital approach. But we also we we call it tailor approach. So we can just go a little bit lower and, and similar to a mini terminal approach, but uh, you can have both angles, the subfrontal angle and the lateral angle for the for the act for the approach. So it could be also we call it extended lateral support orbital. And then somehow you have the same manipulation and same uh, working trajectories. Uh,咱们今今天的时间有限，我们要下一个讲者。如果对这个入录感兴趣的话，再接下来的五天的手术直播，我们会遇到这样的病例，我们再深入探讨，好吗？啊，谢谢啊，不过安志医生发证，certific
a very famous athlete in, in China. So he has very amazing skills to throw basketball. And as a neuroscientist, you may ask yourself, what happens in a man's brain when he does that? And one of the main things that we know is occurring right now is uh, there's changes in the connections between the brain called the synapses. And what exactly happens there? You see uh, here uh, a presynaptic terminal, the end of one neuron, and the postsynaptic spine, the beginning of the next neuron. This is called a synapse. So if you were to put an electrode in here and stimulate, about a millisecond later, you would get a response on the postsynaptic side. And um, if we learn, what happens is that basically on this ending, uh, Oh, okay. Basically, on this ending, of, uh, you have more vesicles. On this ending, you have more receptors, so that the same incoming signal produces a bigger response on the postsynaptic side. We call that potentiation. So, uh, to give you a better idea again about what, what I just said, you, you are right now here in... Uh, for some reason, the video is not playing. Here we go. So you're right now here in the presynaptic ending of one synapse, and the, uh, the, the vesicle fuses, injects its um, content into the cleft. Those will bind to the postsynaptic receptors. Upon binding, these receptors open so that uh, uh, um, ions can flow through and depolarize the postsynaptic side. So <clears throat> when you learn, something, what happens is, is something similar to this here. Uh, so here you see the normal transmission happening from one neuron to the next. And um, here you see when you learn something, you with higher frequency activate the circuit. So, so that at the, at the, after you learn, the same incoming signal produces a bigger response on the postsynaptic side. So this is something we call synaptic potentiation. It happens what you learn. Now, I could stand here and tell you all sorts of things that happen in the brain, but is the actual proof or evidence of that what I'm just saying is, is occurring in your brain? There is. Uh, people have um, looked at rats. So the rat has grasped the pellet like they do here. It's the same as if I would grasp a cup with my hand. And what people have done is, um, if the rat always grasps with the same arm, it creates a hemisphere in the brain that learns and one hemisphere in the brain that doesn't learn. So what they've done is they've sliced the brain and they've indeed found out that the hemisphere where the rat learns has a bigger response compared to the hemisphere where the rat didn't learn. And there's no change in animals that did not pursue this task or learn anything. So, Synaptic potentiation, or long-term potentiation in specific, is one thing that happens in your brain when you learn. Another thing that happens is you, you can see here these little dots that you see. These are the postsynaptic spines that I was uh, earlier talking about. So people have seen that upon this task, the number of these spines increases. So you form more spines on the postsynaptic side if, if, if you learn a movement. So spine formation and synaptic potentiation are two things that happen in your brain when you learn something. Now, the third thing uh, of my title was no-go A. What is no-go A? Um, my, up in, until the 1980s, we always thought that the brain doesn't change. Once you injure something, it's done, and there's no recovery, and there's nothing you can do. And in the 80s, that big dogma formed by Cajal changed. People showed that there is change. So my supervisor was one of the first ones to show that you see here a, a, a growth cone of a neuron. And you see that there is, you see that after 15 minutes, this growth cone is completely collapsed. It doesn't grow anymore. So he identified this protein called no-go A. They call it no-go because eventually it wouldn't let you go. It wouldn't let you walk. So they looked at it, spinal cord injury and paralysis. So they call it no-go. No-go was a stop signal for the growth cone. So they then went on. He thought, what if I block, I develop something to block the blocker? Then the uh, uh, growth cone should be able to grow. So he indeed did this. Uh, and you can see here at the lesion side of a spinal cord injured rat, how much more growth there is 
if you block no grow A as if uh, you have the control, well, there's no growth at all. So he kept on going and, and did the same from the rat to the monkey. You say the same thing here. The monkey was spinal cord lesion, and there's a tremendous growth across the lesion side. And uh, right now, they're trying to do this in the human, and there's a clinical trial ongoing at the moment with this antibody for spinal cord injured patients. So how does NOGO A uh, linked to what I mentioned to you earlier uh, about synaptic plasticity and learning? So I have explained to you that NOGO A blocks the growth of neurons. And if you look at the synapses that I just mentioned to you earlier, you see, you don't have to really be a neuroscientist or extremely clever to see that these two don't look very much different from one another. They're pretty similar, actually. And um, um, people, you know, the actual difference, the only difference, these are, they share very, very similar mechanisms. So when I, when I looked into this, I, I thought, if we know that no-go blocks this, why don't we look if no-go blocks that as well or not? This was this, the question that we started with. And we basically wanted to go and see, does NOGO block synaptic plasticity in the motor cortex? Does it block spine formation? And if it blocks the two um, mechanisms that happen in your brain when you learn, does it affect learning itself a lot? Those were the three questions we asked. Um, here is a, a graph that you can, uh, for those that are not very familiar in the audience with uh, how to measure long-term potentiation, I thought I'd give an introductory uh, slide. So the way you do this is basically, um, you put your electrodes in here to measure circuits, what, a single circuit of the brain. And um, if, you, if you press on your stimulating electrode, you get a response that will look like this. So let's say your response initially is one millivolt large. Your baseline would be at one millivolt, and that is considered a 100%. And you start from there, and you keep repeatedly activating these circuits, like Yao Ming would keep again and again learn something. This is what you mimic in this experiment. So you will see that after and after, this response will increase. So we kept going until we twice got the same response. We call it saturated response. And in this case, you went from one millivolt to two millivolt, or in other words, you have an increase of 100% of LTP. So this is how you read these, these slides, and I thought it's important before I keep on showing you what, what we found. So we, we applied this and we blocked the uh, molecule NOGO A in the motor cortex. And what we found is that indeed, here you see in green, experiments in which the motor cortex neurons are blocked with NOGO A, and this, this is the control. And you see that there's significantly more LTP upon blocking of NOGO A. We did a reciprocal thing called LTD that didn't change much. And basically what this tells you is, let's say I am the synapse. And the floor of this stage is one of my limit, and the ceiling of the stage is my other limit. And the only operating range that I can move around with is this room. So what NOGO A did is basically it lifts up the ceiling. So there's more range for the synapse to operate, possibly allowing you more space to learn. You can see what I just explained in the numbers there as well. So this is one, one theory that we, had, that we postulated initially. Um, we then went on and looked at the second thing that I mentioned in the very beginning, the spine formation part. So the way we did this is basically we had mice, we placed uh, an intrathecal pump that pushed the antibody into the uh, CSF space and it arrived through that route into the uh, motor cortex of the animal. On day zero, we imaged the spines of the animal using two photon microscopy and then we did the same thing six days later and we compared, is, does this antibody increase more spines, yes or no? So what we found, as you can see here, these little dots again, upon ap application of the antibody, you get more spines formed. So to summarize for you, if you block NOGO A in the motor cortex, you increase LTP, you increase spine formation, and the next question was, if you increase these two mechanisms that happen while you learn, do you increase actually learning as well or not? So we did the next experiment, and what you can see here is the animal did this learning task. In green, uh, sorry, in, in gray, you see an animal that received no antibody, but all steps of surgery. So it's a negative control. In orange, you see an antibody that is, serves as a control antibody. So it received everything, but not the actual effective antibody. There's a positive control. 
And in green, you see the groups of animals that receive the anti nogoi antibody. And you can you see here on this axis how many times the animal grabbed this pellet correctly over six days. And you see that after day three, they indeed learn better when they get the antibody. So we went on and we said, okay, what's the purpose of this molecule? It's in our body, something in evolution must have been there that it's, it's present there, but all it does is blocks the good. It blocks learning, it blocks potentiation, blocks everything else. What's the purpose of it being there? And, and we found an answer by doing another experimental setting where we looked at the same thing, but over 12 days, not just over six days. So over 12 days, you see this purple line that's added to it. You see that over six days, when they get the antibody, they learn better compared to the controls. So here, in the green group, we remove the antibody. In the orange and the purple group, the antibody was kept giving, and you see that there's a decline. So something happens after six days that there's overplasticity, unorganization. I don't know what happens, but something that the brain can take anymore, so they decrease in their learning performance afterwards. So we kept on going and we thought, okay, what is the, what is the mechanism of what happens in these things? So what we found was pretty incredible. You can see here the expression of Nogo A protein, and you see during the day, this is the time when the animal sleeps, and this is the time when the animal is active. Or in other words, here, the animal gets new inputs. It sees new things, it hears new things, it sees new environments. There's plasticity going on in the brain of the animal. Whereas in this time, the animal sleeps, and what the animal has learned during the day is being consolidated and manifested while the animal sleeps. So what you see is pretty incredible. When the animal is awake, this protein is going down and down and down and down to allow the change. And when the animal sleeps, this protein is going up and up and up and up to consolidate the newly formed change. It's pretty incredible. So um, we went and looked at this. If this is a local thing, it happens anywhere in the brain. And we found that this rhythm is there in the hippocampus. And it's synchronously organized. Look at the timing. Look how accurately it's organized over the hippocampus, to the motor cortex, to the visual cortex, to the spinal cord, all over the brain. It's pretty incredible. So then we went on and we saw what does this actually mean for learning and changes in a synapse and potentiation. And we measured LTP in the hippocampus at the time of when no-go peaks and when no-go is lowest. And so what we find is when no-go is low, LTP is high, and when no-go is high, LTP is low. Meaning that this protein probably regulates synaptic plasticity on a circadian 24-hour basis. And to prove our experiment, if we block NOGO A at the time of when it's high, so we experimentally lower this, this uh, difference is also abolished. So our last experiment that we did uh, was basically, the mouse was placed here in a radial arm maze test, and the mouse uh, first had to figure out where the food pellets are sitting. So some of these arms have food pellets, as you can see, and some of them don't. So the mouse usually starts with high errors, and then over time it learns where, where the food pellet sits, and it makes less and less and less errors. So we looked at this test at the time when no-go is high and when no-go is low, and we find that whenever no-go is lower, the animal learns better or makes less mistakes. And whenever the no goes higher, the animal learns worse. So you have a certain timing when you can learn things better and when you can't. And this protein seems to be critically involved in this. And we are right, we've submitted this uh, right now, and, and uh, I will be doing final experiments of this, as the reviewers have asked, and hopefully this will be soon published. So, in summary, what I've shown to you is the blockage of the protein NOGO A increases functional and structural synaptic plasticity. Um, blockade of the protein no-go A uh, improves learning in vivo over six days, and it dampens learning if you give it longer than that. I've shown to you that no-go has a biphasic role uh, in plasticity consolidation motor learning, so depending on when you give the antibody, you have 
better learning, but if you give it at the wrong time, you get the opposite effect. And one sentence summary, the research we're doing and the, uh, the work I've presented to you shows you basically that the central nervous system is a very, very fine-tuned balance between plasticity and consolidation. And if you want to go and interfere with this in order to have people suffering from strokes or injury to the brain or aneurysms or all sorts of things that damage brain tissue, what you need to find out is, according to our result, results, when you can give this antibody. So timing seems to be a very, very, very important thing. We've taken this into clinical trial now, and, and these are very important knowledge that we have uh, gained to see that we can give the antibody at the exact right time and hopefully be able to uh, recover a lost function for patients. And uh, with this, I would like to thank my um, supervisors, collaborators, and co-workers for the help and support, and uh, you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Denmark, uh, your very wonderful lecture. Actually, it uh, is beyond my knowledge. So actually, my question is for Professor uh, Hugo. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, in your lecture, you talk about uh, when you talk about the bilateral MC aneurysm, uh, one of the indications is that the M1X uh, is, it should be uh, shorter than 20 millimeters. Actually, in other uh, articles, they also always say that the length is should be uh, 40 millimeters. I, I want to know why the difference because it's very important for the surgery to select the right patient. And, uh, and uh, another question is, if the patient had a longer uh, M1, what, uh, is there any special techniques to make this action? Thank you, sir. Thank you for your question. Uh, that was, that was a radiological study for our series. And, uh, we could measure that it was all patients that we could uh, clip the contralateral of NCA energy, uh, it was less than 20 minutes. It was an ab average uh, 17 to 15 for the M1. And in total, the calculated A1 and M1, it should have been more than 25 minutes. That was what we checked in our radiological data. <laughs> No go A. Okay, thank you. Oh, Professor Zammer, and uh, I'm from uh, the affiliated hospital of Beijing Tsinghua University, and uh, we're doing the uh, uh, studies on the spine, sur sur uh, spine injury and the recovery. So uh, I want to know uh, if this NACO A uh, is uh, doing some of the studies on the spine injury, uh, something like that. Yes. Th thank you for your, for your question. Uh, yes, so there's major studies going on with NOGO A right now. NOGO A is in a clinical trial after this study for stroke and before the study for spinal cord injury, multiple sclerosis, and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So there are four trials going on with Novartis, which is a Swiss pharmaceutical company, and GlaxoSmithKline. I think that the problem with focusing on molecules like NOGO, this is what we've done in the last 30 years. We focused on replacing single molecules to get movement back. If you think about it, the central nervous system is an extremely complicated system. The most complicated in the body, maybe more complicated than the universe. To make a movement like this, 
than drink a cup of coffee. There's a tremendous number of nerves involved in order to do this. It's very naive, I think, if we think that we can restore this complexity with one molecule. So I think it, I come from this field, and I say this as a, as, a, as, a, as a good thing, to say that we should learn from the past. I don't believe that one molecule change is going to make us walk again. So this is probably the one lesson we learned from the last 30 years. I think that we have to change our attitude. And there is 50 other molecules that are involved in this beside Nogo A. You cannot replace all of them. And if you can, you will cause damage and chaos. So I think what we can do, if you figure out a point in the central nervous system, like if you imagine it being a road, and there's a bridge that's damaged. So if you figure out a point and you stimulate this point, you can, all the molecules that are regulated, you can regulate them upon your stimulation. So I think functional neurosurgery and stimulating circuits, I think this is gonna be the next step and we will see in the next 30 years what this will teach us. Okay, thank you. Uh, Today is uh, an historical moment in uh, neurosurgery, and uh, I'm uh, very happy and honored uh, to be here. Like uh, religion, in uh, neurosurgery, we have uh, our holy places. And uh, these places over the years have uh, flourished often away from uh, major cities. Cities don't do neurosurgery. People do neurosurgery. And these holy places in neurosurgery are those places that you must visit in order to stay at the cutting edge and in order to learn uh, your uh, craft. Often uh, these places have been uh, built because of the skills, the personality, and the pioneering spirit of exceptional individuals. In the 70s, Zurich was such a place where Professor Yasergil really designed uh, microneurosurgery. In the 80s, uh, in uh, London, Ontario, Charlie Drake with his skills, his courage, his personality, was not only able to teach us how to approach posterior circulation aneurysms, but also encourage the development of endovascular techniques with uh, people like uh, Gerard de Brun, Jacques Dion, Fernando Minuela. And uh, with the Barnett, he built a neuroscience institute where uh, a lot of the major trials in the 70s and the 80s, the ECIC bypass trial, the NASA study, 
were done and they really redesigned uh, the uh, vascular neurosurgery and cerebrovascular disease. Mayo Clinic was one of such places under the leading uh, uh, example of uh, Tor Sand and uh, many people throughout the world uh, came and uh, learned under his uh, supervision. If you wanted uh, to learn the basic of uh, skull bay surgery, you had to go to Ljubljana in Slovenia, and that's where actually skull bay surgery and uh, not minimally invasive approaches, but minimally traumatic approaches to complex tumors and vascular lesions really started. There is no question that between 2000 and 2015, Helsinki, Finland, had become and was uh, the mecca of uh, neurosurgery, where uh, you, Ernest Niemi, had the courage and the vision to defend and push microneurosurgery boundaries at the time where uh, articles about the demise, the death of uh, microneurosurgery were common, not only in the neurosurgical literature, but also in the lay press. I was uh, hearing in the early 2000s, from, mostly from my friends in Europe, about uh, these uh, fantastic stories about uh, clean, efficient microneurosurgery, respecting uh, normal anatomy. And I must confess that the stories sounded a little bit too good to be true. And uh, I had to go and uh, see by myself. And uh, I was actually the second, second only to Ali Chris among uh, skeptical U.S. neurosurgeons to go to Helsinki. And uh, in a cold uh, February of 2006, I spent uh, a week uh, with Professor Ernest Niemi, and that week changed my professional life and it changed the way I was uh, looking at uh, neurosurgery. He was uh, a very gracious host. He gave me a copy, a signed copy of the posterior circulation uh, book, aneurysm book. He gave me a lot of his reprints. He spent a lot of time with me. And those, when you are a young neurosurgeon and you're starting, and one of the giants in the specialty does those things, those are things that uh, stay with you for the rest of your uh, life. What, uh, also struck me is that uh, after the critical part of the operation was uh, done, as you can see here, actually visitors were encouraged to discuss, to make suggestions, ask questions, including the least experienced among the visitors, and everything was discussed, mistakes, what things that could have been done uh, better. Now, we are all uh, familiar with the accomplishment uh, of the men professionally, the number of surgeries, all the visitors, the residents, the publications. What is important, and I think that, that has also very important implications about what is happening here today, is that uh, this is uh, the symbol on the Mayo Clinic where I have the privilege to work. And uh, you can see that there are uh, three shields. The, the middle one, it's, uh, if you notice, it's a little bit larger. That shield represents the clinical practice. We are doctors, we are surgeons, and there is no question that that is the most important part of what we do. But you can see that there are two shields 
that are there. They are a little bit smaller than the clinical practice shield, but they are equally important for us as leaders and uh, for the places, like as I said before, these holy places in uh, neurosurgery. Why? Well, one uh, shield represents research, advancements in the field. We just uh, heard uh, an incredible lecture about uh, what we can do to improve motor learning. And then the other shield is the education. The education, we have the moral responsibility to educate those that uh, will come after us. What I learned in Helsinki was that uh, you are has been very successful, not only for his incredible surgical achievements, but he has also been extremely successful in the other shields. The research, complex neurosurgical problem were immediately transferred, not in esoteric uh, research, difficult to understand, but uh, in uh, research that could be immediately applied to what we do. And uh, the series of uh, theses uh, published uh, from uh, his uh, fellows and uh, residents are one of the best part of uh, my library. Faith today is duty to education of those who come after him. Uh, he has left a breed of uh, excellent uh, neurosurgeons and uh, scientists not only at home, but uh, all over the world. And uh, many of the fellows that were there when uh, I was there 12 years ago are uh, now very well established in uh, their own field uh, and uh, are uh, um, uh, diffusing the gospel of uh, micro neurosurgery. Now, we all get at the phase of our life and of our career where it's uh, time to slow down, it's time to change, and uh, there are different options. Penfield, for example, after uh, founding the Montreal Neurological Institute and being uh, one of the most celebrated uh, neuroscientists of his time, had an excellent uh, career as uh, a writer with uh, a couple of uh, excellent uh, books. Well, you are, has chosen a different path. He has chosen to follow, this is Giuseppe Garibaldi. Giuseppe Garibaldi is uh, an Italian general that is not only an Italian hero, he unified Italy. But after unifying Italy, it was an incredible task by the time that nation was divided into different states in competition with each other. After that incredible fist, he refused honors, he refused to rest. And what he did, he went to fight in Latin America. And uh, he became the hero of two worlds. And uh, that was uh, your choice. And uh, He's going to be very successful in that. And uh, there is no question, as I was preparing this lecture, I, start think, I was thinking, well, China, there is no question, China is the future of neurosurgery. But as I was thinking more and more about the achievements, as I was thinking about uh, my dear friend, Shubin, in one year, he does more bypasses than the most celebrated neurosurgeon can do in a lifetime. I realized that China is not the future. China is the present of world neurosurgery. And uh, you can see if you open our journals, this is uh, uh, Bulang and his group excellent uh, paper was just published in uh, Stroke. These are just a couple of uh, articles from the latest issue of Journal of Neurosurgery. You can realize that uh, the presence of world neurosurgery, it's here. And uh, it's uh, easy to understand 
what one of the next meccas of neurosurgery is going to be. You, you have all the elements that you need. You have access to large number of patients. You have a group of incredibly talented individuals that are already working here. You have a supportive administration. And then you have the hero of two worlds. Somebody who has already done in, uh, as he said, in a small hospital in Helsinki, Finland. As I said before, I am uh, truly convinced that uh, this is today, it's an historical moment in uh, neurosurgery. I am uh, um, incredibly honored to be able to be here. And uh, my dear friend, uh, Yua, from the depth of my heart, I wish you all the best. I am incredibly proud of being your friend. I hope I can also be somehow part and give a contribution to this effort, which I know is going to be extremely successful. Shishi, Kitos, thank you, grazie.拉丁的教授 没有的话，我们就关掉这个环节，好吧？我们下面是午餐时间，谢谢拉丁的教授，谢谢 Kate。